Welcome. If you're just joining us, um, this is Intro to Financials for Nonprofits. I have to say this has been one of our most requested topics and one of our highest registrations for a hub and R. So if you're here, you're in the right place to learn some really valuable, valuable knowledge about how to run your organization. We're joined today by Tasha Anderson. Tasha is the CEO and the founder of the charity CFO. A lot of credentials there, mm -hmm. well-earned, well-deserved. Tasha, in my world, is the authority on nonprofit accounting. Um, she knows it from the auditing side, from the practical side, from the outside. Um, she can help you navigate what donors might be asking or looking for. The best thing, though, is that she explains everything in a way that is simple, direct, and easy to understand, even for those who don't come from an accounting background. So without further ado, Tasha, tell us, give us your background, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, thanks. And I, I feel I have to admit, I have a little bit of pressure. Accounting usually is not a well attended uh, course. So with that, um, no pressure on there. Uh, so I've been working in the nonprofit space for about 15 years. Uh, Katie, as you had mentioned, I, I had multiple different roles in the nonprofit space. First, I was an auditor. I used to audit nonprofit organizations, did that about seven years. So think about those audited financial statements, those reviews, those compliance audits, anyone that gets federal, state, local government funding. Uh, I used to be the one that audited those, right? So I saw it from that lens. Uh, I did about seven years doing that for four years then shortly, right after I left public accounting and I took a seat as a CFO of about $11 million organization. And so I was what we call on the other side of the table. I was the one then getting audited, not just from my financial statement auditors, which is what I used to do, but I got audited from all of the different uh, government agencies. We had about 12 different government contracts um, and of course foundations and all that. So I had to learn not just, you know, obviously how to get the accounting done, but how then to translate that information in a way that made sense to my board, to all the different funders, because we know they all want it in different presentations, different formats, uh, and then also make sure the uh, accounting work was squeaky clean to get through all the different site visits and, and site audits that we had from all of our different governing bodies, if you will, uh, funders and whatnot. So I did that for about four years. And one of the things I learned was how to survive in a nonprofit world and meet all of those people's expectations and make everyone happy. But I also had um, the responsibilities for everything else administrative, HR, IT, risk management, all those sorts of things. So I figured out a way to get the accounting done as efficiently as possible because I had to survive mostly. Um, I like to think I was just that good, but uh, I think it's mostly out of survival. So I wanted to apply what I learned in, in those two different roles, the auditor and then the CFO. And I started this firm, the charity CFO, uh, a little over five years ago. And right now we work with small to mid-sized nonprofits or in the grand scheme of things, probably considered micro to small. So usually our clients are under um, 10 million in revenue and we do just that for them. We do their ongoing accounting work. So I just wanna start this presentation. Um, Katie, if I can, just go ahead and dive right in. Now that I've done an intro, this is really designed for you as a founder or a CEO or a board member to really be able to ask really intelligent questions about your finances. I'm not going to go over a full audit report. Uh, we can certainly do that in another seminar or webinar if we really want to. But what this is really designed is to give a real a kind of basic intro about some of the jargon, some of the language, understanding some of the differences um, between what maybe you're used to seeing on financial reports and, and what others might be asking for. And I'm actually going to pull up some sample financial statements to walk you through as a former auditor, as a former CFO, as a CPA. I used to sit on boards um, and now I work with many nonprofits. What are the things if I immediately look at financial statements stick out to me so that if I train you how to do that, you're going to able to, you're going to then be able to look at your monthly reports the internal reports I'm talking about, not your audited reports, and you're going to be able to identify this doesn't look right and really help you understand some of the key questions to be asking for. So Katie, if you're okay with that, I'm going to go ahead and launch my screen. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Hopefully everything's working all right. So the first thing that we're going to talk about uh, initially is, is actually there's two different worlds of accounting. There is the accrual based accounting and cash-based accounting, right? Um, most small businesses for profit operate in a cash basis. That's really because that's what the IRS 
just people on this niche business, right? So most businesses, what do I, why, why is this important to you? Uh, most of your board members, of your finance committee members, you know, maybe some of your funders, right? Your donors uh, might be used to seeing things on a cash basis. However, as a nonprofit, especially once you hit that 250, $300,000 threshold, you might then start being subject to an audit if your state requires it, or you might opt into it or for another reason you're gonna get an audit. The audit world, the accounting gods um, could be a generally accepted accounting principle financial report, um, or basically to have things in the way that you're supposed to do, you would have to use accrual basis. And that's kind of one of the disconnects here. So there's actually two different ways to present your accounting information. I'm gonna show you accrual basis, but I do want you to understand the difference between accrual basis versus cash basis, right? So accrual basis really is recognizing things based on when, when, when activities actually happen. Cash basis, when does money actually transfer hands, right? This is really important in the nonprofit space because on a cash basis, revenues are recorded once we receive them and expenses are re reported when we actually pay the bill. And where that becomes challenging for nonprofits if they get commitments for a gift or, um, you know, donations pledged to them, or you receive a gift uh, in January, but your December year end ended in December, then you have that cutoff issue there. Sometimes cash isn't abundant and we don't pay things until cash actually comes in. So we don't recognize the expense until we actually pay them, even though the bill is six months late. Uh, that happens, no judgment here. Um, that sometimes happens. So that's where the cash basis method is really just recording things as they happen. A cruel basis method, this is where things get complicated. I call it the accounting gods. It's, it's essentially FASB or generally accepted accounting principles. These are the people that make the rules, not to be confused with the IRS. The IRS also makes a lot of rules. You would think these two people would be on the same page, FASB and IRS. They are not always on the same page uh, with a few things, but in order to have your books really truly in an accrual basis, we focus not necessarily when cash changes hands, we focus on when activities are actually promised or um, incurred, right? So revenues are usually recorded when earned or pledged. So think about earned. Uh, this is, what month is it now? April, if you're a school and you maybe got paid um, in advance, uh, if, if your school is anything like my daughter's school, uh, you pay in advance, uh, you would recognize that revenue when the, the child starts going to school, right? Or alternatively, if you're a social service agency and you deliver all of these services and then you send an invoice sometime early next month, you're still going to record revenue for April because that's when you deliver the services, right? Even though the invoice isn't sent until May and the, you know, the, the revenue, the, the cash that we're entitled to, maybe that doesn't jump to June, depending on your funding sources, uh, that doesn't matter when cash comes in. It matters when you earned it. Pledges are a little bit unique in the sense it's not necessarily when you earn them because they can't earn pledges you say that loosely, you could, you could have some restrictive pledges. But for the most part, if somebody says, hey, I really love the work you're doing, I'm going to give you a gift uh, next year. It's going to be $100,000, but I, I commit to you. I'm going to put it in writing. I'm going to give you a gift next year. Doesn't matter if they're going to give it to you next year. Doesn't matter if you're going to spend it next year. You have to record the revenue once that commitment is made. What, generally in writing, your auditors wouldn't see that writing. So this is really the accrual basis is really intended to match revenues and expenses within the same period. So revenue, once they're pledged or earned and expenses, we also record those when they're incurred, right? So if payroll isn't till the first week of May, we're still gonna record the expenses in April because your people worked in April and they earned their wages in April. So we're gonna record those expenses in April. The idea in a perfect world that we would be matching revenues and expenses in the same period. Um, for some of you that might be a little bit savvy on the accounting side might say, that's just not really the way it works in practice. I don't disagree with you. What throws a wrench in things is this pledge, right? The accounting gods say that we have to record the pledge regardless of when it comes in, regardless of when we're supposed to spend the money. Uh, but the expenses we're supposed to actually, you know, record when they're incurred. Like that, that doesn't match up. I agree with you. Um, and that's above my pay grade. Unfortunately, I can't change that. But that's really the biggest difference. So cash, when money actually changes hands, accrual basis, we have to stop, pause, think about when did we earn it? When was it pledged? Or when were the expenses incurred? Not necessarily when they were paid. So take a little bit deeper dive. 
like I mentioned, I, I kind of highlighted some of these things for accrual basis. These are the main differences that I notice when we have clients that say, hey, Tasha, we've been operating in a cash basis, but we want to convert to an accrual basis. Again, most organizations want to do this simply because that's what their funders want to see. That's what their board members might want to see. Um, and usually it's because an auditor will require it, right? Uh, and they really want to say, how really are we doing? Have we taken into consideration monies that we know are going to be coming in and monies that we know are going to be going out? Accrual basis kind of puts a placeholder in your financial statements for that, if you will. So as I mentioned, contributions, this is a main area that's different. Cash basis, you record it only if it hits your bank, bank account. Accrual basis, we recognize it when funds are promised or pledged, regardless of when cash is received. And it's at the moment it's pledged, not necessarily the period it's pledged for. That, that's a little caveat there. Program revenue, as I mentioned, um, it's recognized during the month that reimbursable expenses are incurred or services are rendered. So when did you earn it? When did you do the work? That's the month you want to put it in. I see so many times nonprofits will have their contributions recorded when it's pledged, but their earned revenue, they record it when things are deposited. You got to have a consistent methodology for how you're recording all revenue. You don't get to pick and choose, you know, how you, how you record revenue depending on its type. It's not really the way it works. As I mentioned, expenses are recognized as incurred. So a surefire way to know that you're on an accrual basis, you should have accounts payable or credit card balance at any given point. So you've put that uh, invoice that's you know come in your mail, uh, you've opened it up, you've entered the invoice into your accounting system, and we're keeping track of these things that we know we need to pay at some point, even though we may not necessarily have the cash flow to do it. There's some other things I like to call these, all those Excel spreadsheets your auditors ask for. There's other um, asset and liability accounts that you're gonna notice on an accrual basis accounting. Again, if you don't know if you're accrual or cash basis, pull out an internal financial statement. If you see things like prepaid expenses, uh, fixed assets, um, credit card, um, debt, any sort of things like that, any sort of accrued expenses like payroll taxes that you need to remit, anything like that, that um, you see on your balance sheet, you're going to likely be some sort of accrual basis. Okay. So really an accrual is simply an adjustment to your books when cash is not exchanged. Like I said, I think of it in a way of a placeholder, a reminder. Oh yes, I have that money coming in. Oh yes, I have those expenses that I need to pay at some point. So that's kind of the difference between accrual and cash basis. And a lot of people don't really realize that. But then there's kind of this accounting equation and I'm not getting a whole, you know, debits and credits and explaining to you all theory on it. But I do want you to kind of understand a little bit assets, liabilities, net assets. The biggest difference between for-profit and nonprofit accounting really boils down to this idea of net assets. For-profit world, it's equity, right? In the nonprofit world, it's net assets, okay? And really basically what it means on both sides, they just call it something different, is every year, every month, you accumulate either a surplus or a, a deficit, a loss, right? And over time, you're either going to have um, a net income over time, uh, and that's pos positive equity or positive net assets, or you're gonna be at a deficit, right? You've just consistently been posting losses time and time and time again, and you're gonna have you know, a positive or a negative equity, really. And the IRS, when they gave a nonprofit status, it wasn't simply to not make money, to not make profit. A lot of people think, well, nonprofits, we can't have a profit, can't have surpluses. The IRS is going to be mad about that. Here's the difference. I myself own a for-profit business. When I generate a net income, I can distribute that money. I can do whatever I want with it. I can buy a yacht. I can go, I, for the record, I work in the nonprofit space. I'm not buying any yachts anytime soon, <laughs> but I could do whatever I want with it. Um, I could reinvest it on my own thing. I can do whatever it is I want pay myself whatever I want, whatever. The nonprofit world, it's not really like that. You get a surplus, but you don't get the liberty to just go out and spend the money on whatever you want. The idea is the IRS says those surpluses, that net income that Tasha used to go buy a yacht, you have to reinvest that into your organization to continue to expand the work that you're doing in your community. So it's not to say you can't generate a surplus. It's really of that surplus, what are you going to do with it, right? For profit, they can do whatever they want. They don't really have anybody holding them accountable for that, as long as they pay their taxes. The IRS may not be happy about that. Um, and that's really it too. The IRS says, you don't have to pay us taxes. Take that money, reinvest into the community. For me, as a for profit, they say, Tasha, great. Glad you had a successful year. You posted a net income. We want our cut. So I just want to be clear about that. 
um, income statement. Um, so the balance sheet, you're going to see your assets, liabilities, net assets. I like to use the for-profit world uh, terminology on some of these financial statements. Um, we'll get into the more technical titles later, but most people know what a balance sheet is. It's going to talk about what you own or what you're entitled to. Think about receivables, money that people owe you, who you owe, what you owe, right? So is it payroll taxes? Is it wages? Is it you know the electric bill? Whatever it might be. So it summarizes what you have, what you own, what you're entitled to you know, what you minus what you owe to other people. And then what is left, whatever's left over is kind of that surplus or deficit, depending on your financial position is going to tell you, hey, you have this surplus, hopefully, um, or whatever's left over, you then can reinvest into your community. So that's what a balance sheet basically summarizes. Your income statement's a little bit easier. It's just showing the ins and the outs of our economic wealth, I call it. Or, you know, what are we doing with our cash generally, right? So revenue inflows in, <clears throat> expenses outflows, right? Expenses not to be confused with capital purchases, buildings, equipment, those sort of things. Those usually go back up into assets where it's something we own, right? It's not really, hey, we paid the electric bill. It's more like, hey, I bought a computer. That's something I own. That's an investment of some sort. So really to kind of summarize it more of a graphic, you know, what you owe or what you own, what you're entitled to minus what you owe is that net assets. The net assets is, like I said, accumulation of surpluses or deficits, combine those surpluses and deficits. That tells you, okay, this is, you know, generally the pot of money I should have left over. And now I get to choose what to do with it in conjunction with your board or your, your strategic plan or whatever. So now that we got some of the basic jargon um, out of the way, I really want to dive into some common financial reports because I think, frankly, that's why we're all here. Uh, I'm going to actually show you some example financial statements, some real life financial statements um, that my team's put together. I'm going to show you really simple ones because I recognize we're probably, um, some of us come from smaller organizations, some come from probably larger organizations. So I want to give you a sense on very basic versus very advanced financial statements. But before we dive into that, this is where I want to talk a little bit more technical about the, the terminology that we use on these reports. Uh, sometimes you'll have people, when I say the balance sheet and, you know, people get all, you know, reactionary about, well, it's actually called the statement of financial position. Yes, it is. In the nonprofit world, we give our reports special titles, many more words, in it, um, and it oftentimes confuses people. So the statement of financial position really is nothing more than the balance sheet. And a lot of my nonprofits are internal statements. They call it the balance sheet. Um, you know, you can change the titles if you want to, or you can call it whatever it is. Now, if you have an audited financial report um, with the footnotes and all the, you know, letters and words behind it, the footnotes that explain everything in detail, those are going to have the official formal titles. But just for you to know, when people talk about the statement of financial position, think about financial position, what you own, who you owe, what you owe, and what's left over. That tells you the financial position of the organization. That's also the balance sheet. Statement of activity, just think of activities, what's happening, what's coming in, what's going out, right? That's an income statement, profit and loss, statement of revenues and expenditures. That report has multitude of names, um, but just know for all intents and purposes, it's, it's a P&L or an income statement. Um, really what I pay most attention to is the bottom line. Do I, do I see a net surplus or do I see a net loss? And it's important for you as a leader of an organization to know on a monthly basis, are you trending consistent losses or consistent gains or some variation? And I know corporate or you know business accounting can be really overwhelming for people, but I really try to boil it down to you know like your own personal financial budget. If you're consistently burning through more money than you're bringing in, say your paycheck is a thousand a month and you're spending twelve hundred a month. That's not sustainable. Over time, you're going to burn through all of your savings. You're going to spend all the things in your checking account. And if you continue spending at that pace, then you're going to have to ask yourself, well, how am I going to cover this deficit? I only bring in a thousand, but I'm spending 1200. So that's when people start borrowing on credit cards, right? Maybe they take out loans. Maybe they borrow from families and friends and they start, you know, they start financing their lifestyle through debt. Companies do the same exact thing. They do the same exact thing. So you want to make sure that you're in a good cash flow position. I oftentimes say revenues, expenses, budget, all these things are important, 
But if you don't have cash because cash is king, you really have nothing. So think about it in the way of personal finance. If I don't have more money coming in than going out, I'm going to find myself in a tough situation for which then I'm going to have to tap into um, probably unhealthy ways of financing my operation. So as a leader of an organization, I strongly encourage you to look at that profit and loss statement, compare it month over month. Um, we'll show you a little bit more examples of that in a, in a few more slides. Um, the next one is a statement of cash flows. This, I say this is moderately useful because it's really confusing for people. Um, it's often requested by board members, but not really regularly used. Um, and really what they're asking, what did you do with the cash? <laughs> if, we're, if we're showing we're having all this revenue and we're in line with our budget, why do we not have any cash? So usually when people say, I want to know what you've done, you know, where are your cash flows or where's your cash flow report? They usually want to know what did you do with your, with your um, cash balance, right? And unfortunately, the statement of cash flows isn't really clear on what did you actually spend the money on? And I'll show you what that looks like here in a little bit. Um, budget to actual, that's not a formal official uh, report. You're never going to see that in an audited financial statement. In my mind, it's absolutely mission critical to know what did you plan and what's actually happening compared to that plan um, on a monthly basis and even drill it down in more detail, which we'll talk about later. So I think where people get really confused and, and kind of overwhelmed um, and I certainly saw this when I was a CFO of a nonprofit, you will have numerous versions of what an internal monthly reporting package could look like. You could have a balance sheet, a P&L, skip the statement of cash flows because no one cares. You could have a P&L by month, year to date. You can have a budget to actual. You can have a budget to actual by program. There is no right or wrong way to present internal reports. An internal report is simply a report, a tool that is useful for you to understand what's going on. Um, who, I'd like to say, who has your money? Like who, who owes you and who are you supposed to pay? And is everything moving in the way that it should? So there's no right or wrong presentation. Focus on usefulness above all else. So with that, I'm going to um, skip on over to the statement of financial position. We're going to talk a little bit about that and I'm going to show you, um, I'm actually going to show you an example of it. So let's go ahead and dive right in. Again, we've kind of already covered this, but statement of financial position, just remember, it's going to include assets, liabilities, and whatever's left over, right? Um, assets, anything that we own, you would expect to see cash, property, equipment, receivables, investments, prepaids, anything like that will show up at the top of the report. The liabilities, who you owe um, to vendors, creditors, employees, whether it's invoices or payroll or whatever, um, that's going to be in the middle of the report. And then at the bottom, it's going to be that accumulation of surpluses and losses. And this is where people get a little confused too. The surpluses can have restrictions on them. You could have had somebody give you a gift for a specific purpose, and we call that restricted net assets. Um, and basically what it is, is a designation by a donor that uh, is for a specific purpose or a specific time period. So you would generally see the balance of what your net assets are, um, whether they're restricted or unrestricted. We'll talk about that a little bit more. So again, there's really no right or wrong way to show an internal balance sheet. I just, I just encourage you, if you like to have custom kind of unique reports, the only warning to you all is that if you do get an audit, you then have to be able to produce a report, uh, the statement of financial position or balance sheet in accordance with how um, the accounting gods want to see it. That's the only thing. So we have different custom reports that look nothing like the generally accepted accounting principles. Um, but we know that at the end of the year, we have to essentially uh, rework the format of that and maybe convert some of the numbers um, from an internal management tool to an external tool. Okay, so with that, let's go ahead and take some exam. Uh, let's look at some examples of a balance sheet. Hopefully you all can still see that okay. I think you can. Okay, so here is a basic statement of financial position. And I really don't really need to go over so much what it includes. Um, like I mentioned earlier, we're gonna have assets here. Let me try to blow this up a little bit more so everybody can see that. Hopefully that's easier to see. And hopefully um, everybody can still see everything. I think so. Okay, you're also gonna see liabilities here, like I promised, what you owe to other people. And then down here, you're gonna see equity, right? And I'm gonna dive into this a little bit more. 
All right, so these are my notes. This is Tasha's observations when I look at this because I have to review financial statements and I have to decide, look, uh, does this seem normal? Because when I present it to a finance committee, I have to anticipate what they're going to be looking for. And then I have to come up with a response to my anticipated questions that they have. And this is just kind of an example of what I did for one of those clients. So your financial position, first things first, I always like to compare it with some point in the past. I usually like to compare apples to apples. So in this case, this is actually as of December 31st. I'm comparing it last year with the year before because I wanna compare where were we at the end of the year and where were we the same point last year? Are we better or worse off? Now, one thing to note, the statement of financial position is only a point in time. As we all know, you could show yourself having tons of cash in your bank account, but that could change tomorrow as soon as payroll hits. So just know that it's only a point in time. So I like to make sure they're comparative, but some of the things I ask myself, cash, Cash is what I'm always focused on. Um, I know maybe a lot of accountants don't think about that way, but I used to have to write the checks. <laughs> I used to have to figure out who we're paying and make sure we had enough money for payroll. So I keep a close eye on cash. I ask myself, if I'm looking at this balance and I'm a leader of you know, an organization, I'm gonna try to think about, do I have enough cash? What bills do I currently pay or need to pay? Um, what expenses do I expect ongoing within the next few weeks? Um, do we have enough um, cash uh, to cover payroll? Do we know when our invoices are going to be paid by our vendors or funders? Um, do we have, you know, do we have any delays in funding, right? I mean, especially COVID-19, many, you know, government agencies especially got a little slow on some of their payments. So just really kind of think through, just like you would with your own personal finances, okay, I know that my paycheck comes in on these dates, you know, the 15th and the last day month, you know, my rent comes out on this day, my car payment comes out on this day. These are the main things that as a leader of an organization, I would be thinking of, you know, when payroll hits, you generally might know if you have contracts that are funded, you generally know when they're going to be paid. Um, you know, and if you have pledges, that's a bit of a wild card. If you're an organization, that gets mass donations in small increments, a lot of crowd fundraising, or you have campaigns, you're not really sure when the checks are gonna hit, it's even more important for you to pay attention to cash. Ideally, we'd always have about three months worth of cash in reserves. So if you don't know generally what that looks like, you just take your um, you know, budgeted expenses, annual expenses divided by 365 days. That's your daily I call it like burn rate, like that's how much cash you need. And then you take your cash divided by, um, wait, no, your burn rate, right? Divided by cash balance. I think that formula is right. But basically I wanna know how much does it take for me to stay afloat? What is a cash daily burn rate or monthly? What's your spend? Are you $50,000 a month? And if I look at this, I don't even have a month's worth of cash here. So if you think like, okay, how many months of cash do I want? I recommend three months of cash. So if you know you spend about $50,000 a month, you need $150,000. Um, you need $150,000 worth of cash in the bank at any given time. I would strive for that. Um, some people say, that's great, Tosh. I'd love to you know, really get three months worth of cash. I'm not really sure how to do that. Again, the best way to do it is just plan on a saving mechanism. What I do is I include in my budget some sort of margin um, 2%, 3%, 5%. It could certainly be more aggressive than that if you want, but the only way to save cash to build your cash reserves, um, is to bring in more than you spend. And so you can kind of plan on that by way of your budget, or you can just kind of hope and, you know, you get really lucky and, and you get some unexpected gifts that come in. Um, I, I personally like to encourage my organizations that aren't at that 90 days or three months worth of cash to start planning on you know, a savings, just like in your personal finances, you wanna buy a house someday, you gotta, you gotta start squirreling money away a little bit. Okay, so liabilities, some of the things I'm looking at, so this is really just total liabilities. I'm asking myself some questions. Is this number getting bigger or smaller compared to this time last year or compared to this last month? Um, why is it not getting smaller, right? You always want your debts to go down. Why is it not getting smaller? Is it a timing difference means, oh, 
we got that invoice a little bit earlier than what we expected or you know payroll just hit differently or whatever um is it we don't have the money are we in a cash flow bind your your invoices are going to keep stacking up stacking up stacking up if you don't have cash to pay them so that could be a negative trend um, are we spending more than what we're bringing in? I mean, generally, that's what my organizations find themselves. Um, they're in a cash flow crisis, uh, and we stop paying bills. And they keep stacking up and stacking up. And certainly, as we all know, that's not sustainable. OK, and then down here, you'll notice I have equity on mine, um, but technically, it's net assets. Um, I'm asking myself, OK, this is really this number here. This is my equity, my ending, my ending balance, the surpluses accumulated. Are there any restrictions? Are we able to monitor what those restrictions are? Do we know what the balance really is? Is this actually what I expect? So if we had some, we'll talk, show this in another example, but if there are restrictions on your net assets or your equity, do we know what those are? Are we actually keeping track of those? Are these numbers actually accurate? So if you know, hey, I don't see anything in here for temporarily restricted, nothing says temporarily restricted um, or restricted in any way, but I know we received $10,000 for a specific program, we should probably keep track of that. This section is how you keep track of those things, right? Um, one of the things I like to point out is if you do have restrictions, say you have $50,000 worth of restrictions on the money that you've collected, scroll back up here, ask yourself, do I have at least $50,000 of money in the bank account? And if not, what that tells you is you've kind of robbed Peter to pay Paul. Meaning if somebody give you $50,000 for a program and you haven't spent any of those dollars yet and you don't have $50,000 in your checking account, you probably, it's not illegal. It's not illegal. It's just not a sustainable business model, right? Our obligation as a nonprofit is to make good on the promise to the donor at some point in time that we agreed on. But there's no rules to say that you can't essentially rob Peter to pay Paul and cover payroll with some of those costs. The problem is eventually you've got to pay up or you've got to deliver. And if you don't have a model to replace those funds um, at some point in time, then it's not really a sustainable business model for you. I see numerous nonprofits for the record um, kind of do that rob Peter to pay Paul because of seasonality and fluctuations. But where we keep track of that is in that equity section, that net asset section. And we ask ourselves, what are the responsibilities and the obligations that we've made to the funders that we need to keep track of mentally with respect to our cash balance, right? Make sure you're not what they call underwater. Um, I see this oftentimes in churches. Churches operate on a pretty slim margin, but they have lots and lots and lots of designated funds, special offerings. And we collect all of these funds for these special purposes. We're not really supposed to spend on operations but the church doesn't have any money. So they pay payroll with whatever's in their checking account, not realizing that they've collected all these designated funds that are supposed to be for a specific purpose. So I've seen that pretty often in, in the faith-based community. Okay, so that's a basic version. Um, the advanced version really is, so you'll notice in this particular example, I'm still comparing year over year. Here I've actually broken down restricted cash versus unrestricted. You'll notice they have a decent amount of restricted cash. Um, if there's a way for you to segregate the balances, I prefer to do that, um, especially if you have an endowment or, um, you know, so like one of these funds, um, it's uh, capital improvements that the board's kind of designated or a donor has designated. Um, so I'm just comparing overall cash balance. Look, obviously, this is a much better year than it was last year. So I'm looking at is money going up or down receivables. This organization um, is has a lot of different pledges for galas, um, and we are, have a lot of earned revenue. So I'm always keeping a close eye on, you know, like I like to joke and have my CEO say, where is my money? Because sometimes, unfortunately, the squeaky wheel gets the oil. And if you know that your funder generally pays on the 20th, and they don't pay you on the 20th, and you need that money to make your payroll, I'm on the phone calling them, where's my, where my payment? So I like to provide this balance sheet um, I actually like to provide an accounts receivable listing um, to my CEOs, especially with a lot of um, earned revenue and an accounts payable listing so they can track where's my money, when's it coming in, who's late, um, and what do I still owe people, right? So you can keep track of all that. Um, so yeah, just asking yourself, are we collecting? I had a situation where um, accounts receivable just kept growing and growing and growing and growing. And uh, the CEO reached out to me and was interested in working together. Um, I took a quick look at her accounting system and I said, you, you know, you have about $500,000 in receivables, but over 300,000 is 90 days late. That's why you're in a cash flow issue. You can't make payroll. You've earned the revenue. 
you posted the revenue on your books, the finance committee and the board thinks you're doing well. You're not actually losing any money. The problem is you're just not collecting the cash that you've earned. So now you can't even make payroll. So we need to figure out how to fix that. Um, and if your accounts receivable keeps growing and growing, you need to figure out your billing issues and figure out why people aren't paying you. And it could be um, internal. That's one of the things I realized some um, training opportunities need for billing to make sure that goes out on time and accurate to um, eliminate any delays. Okay, so some other things on here, like I promised, prepaids, um, you know, fixed assets, those sort of things, um, you know, making sure that accumulated depreciation should be increasing every month. This is really just, hey, your assets become less and less valuable over time. Um, you would expect that to change and grow each year if your accountant is uh, recording those sort of things. Same thing, accounts receivable, I want to know, is this going up? Why? Is this an issue with cash flow? Are we, are we not in a good place or is it just merely a timing issue? Um, and then just kind of noticing other things here, um, you know, this, this, for example, is just when payroll hits, you know, sometimes it's, you know, we accrue uh, 10 out of 14 days. Sometimes it's 12 out of 14 days. Uh, it's just a formula. So we can explain that. But if your credit card keeps mounting, like why, um, I, uh, know a nonprofit that, um, credit cards, um, they weren't paying credit card balances on time. And there was a fraud issue where somebody was taking cash advances on the credit card. So if that's being reconciled properly, you could start asking yourself, why is the credit card balance keep climbing? That doesn't seem to make sense. And here's what I was talking about with those restricted assets where you can really see in this particular case, right? This is what we've got for restricted assets. I want to go up here. Okay. I've committed somebody something. Basically I've committed $365,000 to some sort of purpose or time. And I want to go up here. Okay, I have 1.2 million in the bank account. I'm good. If that was a different situation, like that was 125,000. You see what I'm saying here? And we have $365,000 of restricted assets and I go back to cash and I only have 150,000. I'm in trouble. Like I'm upside down in a pretty big way. So that is... Um, the balance sheet. So let's move forward uh, back to, let's see if I can open up all my notes again. Give me a second here. Okay, move that over here. Perfect. Okay. So that is the um, balance sheet. That's the balance sheet. Now we're going to talk a little bit more about the statement of activities. Um, as I mentioned before, the statement of activities is basically the profit and loss statement. Um, it's just showing revenues, uh, the money coming in, generally, hopefully. <laughs> um, I say money coming in, assuming you're collecting on your receivables and people are actually paying you. Um, don't always make that assumption. Um, expenses, obviously cash flow out. And the change in net assets is the for-profit world of net income or loss. So as I mentioned before, pay attention to those net incomes and losses over a period of time. And now I'm going to show you um, what a basic PL or statement of activities and a more advanced statement of activity looks like. Okay. So here, very basic, as I mentioned, revenue up here. And again, there is no right or wrong way to do it. It just needs to make sense. And you're going to see expenses down here, as I promised. In this particular case, like we've kind of shown direct support. Um, you'll notice I kind of like to show it in a way that grantors, funders, foundations, how those applications are going to come through. Um, I like to set my accounting system up in that way. I also like to take into consideration what a tax return, the 990, um, 990 PF or some version, whichever version you're looking at, the IRS wants it in a specific format. So how it's set up. There's no right or wrong way. Uh, it just has to be useful. And because you have so many different versions of it, you have to produce. I'd like to take the end user into consideration. So in this case, we keep track of, um, you know, we have direct public. So we have grants. We keep grants separate than we keep, um, you know, basic contributions, right? So how much is coming in from grants and how much is coming in from contributions? Um, and then you'll see kind of corporate you know, foundation, individuals, et cetera, et cetera. You're also going to see special events down here. Um, you know, if you have United Way or some other federated campaign, any program revenue, that sort of thing. Um, and then your expenses are just by kind of like natural class, you know. And again, you can use the IRS tax return um, as, a, as a guide for that. But some of the things I'm looking at, um, revenue, how's it going? Is it up or down? Notice that I'm comparing the same period 
You could also have, um, if, if it doesn't make sense to compare to prior period because this year is a completely different year, then maybe you want to compare by month for this current year. How's January looking compared to February, compared to March? You know, how's April, um, you know, holding up to that, right? So you can change it however you want. But in this case, I'm looking at, man, uh, 2020 is, you know, way better than 2019. And that's what I would expect. Um, and ask yourself, is it what I would expect? If I know I had an additional contract and yet my P&L is showing less money than last year, then, you know, kind of what's going on there. Uh, also asking myself, where is the money coming from? So understanding who's giving you the money or how are you earning it? More importantly, will we get it next year? That's going to be important for just strategy, planning, um, budgeting. Are there any strings attached to these funds, like restrictions uh, that we know that we need to deliver soon in the short term or maybe in the long term? And also, again, one thing to note here, just because it shows up in revenue does not mean it's been collected. It has been collected. Okay, so this is where I think a lot of business owners, frankly, I don't even think it's just nonprofit space, miss it because I look at cash in my business first and foremost. Who, who did I bill? Who didn't pay me? Who still owes me money? Am I going to, because if cash is good, generally everything else is working well, um, generally. Okay, cash can only stay good for so long um, if things aren't going well for you, right? So a lot of times somebody will just look at the budget to actual like, oh, we expected to bring in 50,000 and we brought in 60, that's great. Um, oh, we only expected to spend this much money or a little bit over, but you know, nothing to be alarmed with. But if you're not actually asking yourself, just because these revenues are showing up here on an accrual based, which is how most nonprofits are, are in that place or they wanna be in that place, does not mean the cash has been collected. So keep, keep an eye on that. Uh, and then ultimately, you know, are we making more money than what we're spending? So kind of going down here in this case, all the way down to the end, this shows us a surplus or deficit means a change in cash. If it's positive, means you have more cash likely than you did uh, last month or last period. Um, if you have a negative, that means you burn through some of your cash. And again, that's the thing that's not sustainable. And then of course, expenses, um, you know, Again, this is really simple, but are they reasonable? Are they business related? Um, are they, uh, you know, growing? Are they shrinking? Um, are they in line with what you expected? And if not, dive in and ask questions to understand why. And then ultimately, many of you um, probably know this, but salaries tend to be the most expensive part of operating a nonprofit. What I've seen, I tend to work more in social service, um, education based. Um, with that, Kind of model of nonprofit, it's usually 60 to 80 percent of our um, 60 to 80 percent of our expenses are related to payroll. But also asking yourself, is most of your money going to program activities? And knowing that ratio that most of us probably already know, 75 percent or more of every dollar needs to go to the program, and the rest, about 25 percent, usually go to some, goes to some combination of management, general, and fundraising. Um, and if your accountant is not able to give you that information, uh, it doesn't mean that it's not possible. It just means that your um, accountant has to set it up a little bit differently. So on an advanced, those are some of the key areas that I would ask myself, but you'll notice that on a more an expanded version, a different alternative, we have restricted versus unrestricted. We've now incorporated some government campaigns. Um, we've now broken up, this is a school. Uh, so we've got some different um, earned revenue there, some different special events, uh, you know, asking yourself, like, for example, this program revenue, why is this so different? Asking yourself that question. And really, you can tell the time period, I mean, COVID-19 shut the school down. So that's completely reasonable. But we want to go through really line by line and kind of asking ourselves, does this make sense? Um, and the expenses, like I said, uh, they're, they're just more expanded. Generally, we want to break things out and monitor things much more closely. Um, and then at the end of the day, net revenue. So you'll notice uh, non-COVID-19, we had a positive, the same period year over year, we had a $593,000 net income um, in the same period for the same months. Um, this year, we had a $409,000 loss. So substantial. Um, changes, right? Okay. 
So um, I'm going to briefly go over next the statement of cash flow. As I mentioned, that's usually broken down into three different buckets. I'll show you what that looks like. Moderately useful, and I think you'll see here why. Um, I'll show you that the area that I'm most focused on is cash flow from operations, meaning your normal business, not borrowing money, not financing things, um, not investment activity, um, not selling or purchasing your assets. Like really, are you able to survive on your own if you're based on your normal operations? So the statement of cash flow, you'll see here why this is mildly useful. This isn't like, oh, Tasha, a statement of cash flow, I would expect you paid this much in payroll and you paid this much to the utilities. And that's not what the statement of cash flow is. It's really, well, you had a change in accounts receivable and you had a change in accounts payable and you probably earned some revenue and paid some bills. We're going to assume you did that, but this is really change in the balance sheet. It's not you spent X amount of dollars on salaries or what have you. That's why I say it's mildly useful. I really just look at this line item here. Did the core function of the nonprofit make money or lose money? That's what a statement of cash flow tells me. It means, you know, are we able, are we sustainable? If this is consistently negative, that means, as I gave the example before, on your personal life, if you're spending more money than you're bringing in, you're likely borrowing on credit cards, borrowing from your family, taking out short-term loans, whatever it might be, um, nonprofits, businesses, any business is the same way. So if you're not, sub if you're not sustainable, uh, if you're not posting or at least narrowing this um, net cash provided by operations year over year, you're going to have to figure out some other way to survive. And usually that's pretty unhealthy lending habits. Um, okay, so net cash flow by operating activities. This just basically tells you, did you sell or purchase any sort of investments, capital investments generally. Financing activities is usually going to tell me, did you pay back or did you take on any new loans? So you'll notice in this case, um, we lost a bunch of money operationally. How did we pay for that? We borrowed some money. PPP loan, we borrowed the money. That's what it tells me. So it's helpful for like maybe a CPA or a financial, you know, analyst of some sort for most, um, you know, most people it's not helpful. Uh, usually a board, like I said before, will give you, um, they'll ask you for a statement of cash flows. And what they really want to know is what specific expenses or line items did you spend your money on? And the best way that I do that is go back to a cash basis within QuickBooks, if you have QuickBooks, but usually any accounting system can do this. You go and run a profit and loss, even by month for the year. And instead of a cruel basis, because like I said, that's not taking into consideration when cash left your bank account or hit it, but you go and run it on a cash basis. Instead of a cruel basis version, you want a cash basis profit and loss statement. And that will usually tell your board what actual cash came in, what actual cash went out. Uh, and that tells them, you know, a little bit more about the activity of cash. So I want to give that a little tip there. Okay. So let's see. I already gave you an example of the statement of cash flow, um, budget to actual report, one of my favorite reports, setting expectations for the year and managing, you know, what that looks like. Uh, certainly you can have budgeted revenues, budgeted expenses, actual revenues and actual expenses. Um, you could also include uh, that by month or by department. It's really how level of, how much detail do you want to get into? And that's what I would generally include on a budget to actual report. Let me just see if I have a copy of that. Yes, I do. Okay, so here's where maybe some people don't realize this is actually, if you hide this, hide it, how do I hide it? Uh, this is actually your profit and loss statement or your statement of activities. And all you're doing is adding your budget column here, right? And really what you wanna make sure, does your budget align with what you actually did and why? It's fairly self-explanatory, but one of the key tips that I would take into consideration, does your budget line item match with what's in your accounting system? So for example, if you see, we probably have a couple of situations down here. Um, so see like this one, we didn't have that line item budgeted. Maybe we should have going forward. So start looking at some of these, so like this one, that, that was a new um, funding source for us. We didn't have that budgeted, but if you start seeing things that don't align, like you have something in your actual column and not in your budget, I would pause and say, is this new or did we just put it in the wrong category? 
Um, is it unexpected? Uh, if it's revenue and it's new, that's great. If it's expenses, it's not so great, right? So there's probably a few of those down here, like this miscellaneous small, but still um, employee relations. We don't have that budgeted anywhere at that point in time. So that helps you understand um, what things are going here. Make sure you input your budget into, we use QuickBooks Online for most of our clients, but within your accounting system. So you can easily run these reports on a comparative basis and aggregate them out by month or by, 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 um, um, by month or by department. Uh, and then also, are we on track? Um, meaning as you look at some of these things, ask yourself, are they temporarily off or are they permanently off? Big difference. Uh, and hopefully your accountant helps you understand where they are off or your program people or you should know, are these temporary or off? So that's the um, budget versus actual, but the same thing expenses net. What really what I'm looking at, we basically expected a balanced budget. We're actually losing $187,000. Pretty big difference to try to make up. A few more reports that I'm not going to go over, but I just personally like. Um, I've kind of hinted on many of these already. But in addition to the reports I already showed, I like showing for my clients a statement about that's a P&L by month, um, a P&L by department. By department is helpful because it tells you who are the loss leaders here, where are we investing a lot of our resources. Uh, the department that has the biggest losses tell you this is where most of my fundraising is going. Um, and then you can ask yourself, does it make sense to continue doing this program and fundraising at this level or not? Um, I also like budget to actual by month and budget to actual by department. Again, know your audience, know who you're sending this for. Maybe you as a CEO, you get all of these reports. Maybe you want your program people getting a handful of reports, your fundraising people getting a handful of reports. There's really no right or wrong way um, to set those up. But I just want to leave you with this. This is um, a good slide. This is really how I train my team members to review financial statements. Um, when they're kind of analyzing our client files uh, and really focusing on broad trends, not necessarily monthly activity, although big changes in monthly activity is a strong indicator that something might be um, off, but it also could be merely a timing. Um, always start with a statement of financial position of the balance sheet. So are the receivables good? Are the payables good? Does the cash balance look right? If that's the case, then everything else on the revenues expenses are probably categorized properly. Um, pay close attention to cash. I think we kind of talked about that and how it correlates with net income. Um, always pay attention to your cash, know where you're at all the time with that. Um, try to understand short and long-term overdue balances on accounts receivable. Get regular, if not weekly. Uh, if you have a lot of earned revenue, get regular accounts receivable. Um, let's see, I look at that even for my business every single week. Um, look for overdue payables or short-term liability balances. There could be fines, penalties, interest, and all those sort of things. Um, but making sure, frankly, that just bills are getting paid. It may not be a cash flow issue. It could be an accounting department issue. Um, let's see, look at revenues and expenses compared to prior year and by budget. Sometimes like 2019 or 2020 rather, budget is out, out the window, right? So maybe we want to just compare month over month, figure out what makes sense for you to compare it to. Um, starting by looking at total revenues and total expenses, does total revenue seem consistent? I have some agencies, their revenues are so consistent month over month that I can immediately look at it and say something's wrong here. Same with expenses. And so when I just look at those three lines, total expenses, total revenue, net income or loss, and I could tell I needed to probe further into this. Um, and then just consider how changes in timing, right? Permanent or temporary differences in the budget could impact your overall financial info. So with that, Katie, I think that's all the, I'm gonna leave everybody with this if they want to, uh, but I think we can dive into questions probably now, but this is the end of my slides if people wanted to hear more. Um, so the Q and A and the chat have filled up with questions. Great questions. Um, I've kind of sorted them out by category to, Hopefully you can cover a few of them at one time. Sure. Um, so the first one, super simple. Can you have a hybrid of accrual and cash basis accounting? Um, usually uh, what they call that a modified cash. And that's just a hybrid basically. And it's, we like to record revenues and expenses basically when they get recorded or when they, when they come in. But a lot of times people like to keep track that placeholder of 
significant things like fixed assets. We don't want to lose sight of the fact that we have a mortgage. We don't want to lose sight of the fact that we bought a building or some land or something like that. They're really just placeholders. So yes, they have a modified cash basis is what that hybrid is called. Um, but usually your auditors would come in and, and um, convert everything to accrual basis. Occasionally you'll see a report um, that's on a modified cash basis, but the auditors will just put a disclaimer in there. Hey, this is not generally accepted accounting principles, but funders would usually accept it. Very cool. Okay, can you address investment accounts with the 501c3? How should they be accounted for? Is growth in the account revenue? If the investments fall, is it an expense? Great question. So a lot of times people kind of have investments, especially in the nonprofit space, and they set it and forget it, right? And we know the market changes fairly significantly, even from day to day. Generally, what we do is we recognize, so the investments sit on the balance sheet as something we own, right? Something we're entitled to, something we own. And then each month we get a statement that shows us, did the market value go up? Or did it go down? Now, if you're on a cash basis, you probably don't think about your investment earnings unless a check comes in and you deposit it and, and it's investment earnings. But from all of our clients, all of our clients are on a accrual basis. What we do is we get the financial state, the, um, the investment statements every month. And we look to see did the investments go up or did they go down? And that change is, is it's usually all considered revenue, although you could have negative revenue if the market went down, but it really just accumulates you know, throughout the year, every single month. So we do record it as it's considered like other income uh, or investment income, different from operations, but it does, it should be reflected on your profit and loss statement. Um, and then also it kind of shows up on both, right? So if the value of the assets go up or down, that'll show up on your balance sheet because you're the value of what you own has gone up or down. And the other side of that is it will show up as revenues and expenses in that same month, that same period. If it went up, it's a positive number. If it goes down, it's a negative number. And this is confusing sometimes for the fundraising department where I may or may not have gotten into some disagreements about how things like an endowment gift should be recorded because we're not just necessarily endowment, but it could just be a stock gift, right? And the fundraising department will say, well, Tasha, they gave $10,000. And I'll say, yes. And we recorded it $10,000. But then it went up by $2,000. So can't I count that $2,000 you know, from our investment portfolio as part of my fundraising goal? I said, are you willing to count the losses? Because you can't just have this one way, right? So um, the investment earnings is not considered fundraising or programmatic. It's considered GNA because we don't want to ding the fundraising department for the losses, which there are many years where we do have losses, um, but they also don't get the benefit of the gains either. They really just record the value of those investments um, at the time, you know, whatever it ends up being, the cash or the gifts that come in at the at the moment it's received. So. That a little bit more info than you asked for, but th that is a common debate. You might have that in your organization. That makes sense, though, because, I mean, we charge our development people with enough. They can't control the economy as well. <laughs> we don't want to penalize them for what they have no, no control over. Yes. Okay, I'm going to jump. Um, we can come back to accrual. I want to be sensitive to the time. Um, I am going to go over by just a few minutes, if that's okay with you. Yep, works for me. Okay. So grants, um, we have some, some complicated questions, but they're good. So um, this individual is trying to help their board understand that they get a multi-year grant, um, a three-year grant, they'll see a large amount in year one, but then in year two and three, it seems like very little. Mm -hmm. um, how, do they, how do they report that? How do they reflect that to their, so that their board understands? Right. Well, work is complicated is, if you look at generally accepted accounting principles statement, so your audit, imagine what your audit's going to look like. Your audit's going to make you record that entire grant, regardless of its three years, in the year it was pledged. And all your revenue gets pushed into that year, right? So you're going to have this huge uptick in revenue, and it's going to be like, oh my gosh, we had this amazing year, um, and we're showing all this revenue one year. The problem is then your expenses happen in year one, year two, year three. So it might show that you're actually losing money in those years, right? And we all know boards don't like to see deficit budgets and they don't like to see deficit financial reports. So usually what I do is I explain this temporary difference of, you know, revenue has to be recorded this year, but the expenses are going to hit in subsequent years. 
And to bring some level of understanding about this, what I do when I prepare a budget, I add a line item that says um, revenue released from restrictions. Now I'm trying to get this where it's not too complicated. It's not actually real revenue because you recorded it last year. It's just a placeholder to show here are the resources we expect to have this year, new donations coming in, releases from restrictions coming in. Maybe we wanna plan on a transfer from the endowment or whatever it might be. And then I show what are we gonna spend those resources? How are we gonna spend those resources? Salaries, overhead, et cetera, et cetera. So I usually do that in a way by the budget of just having a line item that shows released from restrictions. So they know, oh, you collected that last year and we're spending it this year. So fast forward, you know, after year one, when we get the audited financial statements, they're going to say, Tasha, you know, you told me we were balanced budget and we were expecting to have, you know, a balanced budget or at least not a deficit. And I'll have to go back and remind them that remember the re revenue was recorded last year. We're just spending it down. And the issue is the release from restrictions are not going to show up that way on your audited financial statement. So that's where the, there's a lot of confusion um, and we still have to keep going back. So actually what I do is I create like two custom reports, basically a PL that shows that line item, I actually create a line item that says revenues released from restrictions. And I call that like my operational PL. And then I have like my generally accepted accounting principle PL. One is gonna show, hey, we're on track with what we expected and we're doing what we said we were gonna do. That's the operational PL. And then I have the gap-based, the audit report type PL that shows, and we're losing money on this, but we understand why. And usually each month I go back and say, and the difference is those release restrictions. I know that's a lot of jargon. I hope that answers some of the questions, but I really just try to create a placeholder and give some visual understanding about we're spending these dollars down. We're not operating at a deficit necessarily, even though the reports are going to show that, but we have to spend the money down. That's what we were required to do. It's not when you get into major grant funding and especially multi-year grants, that's probably a good time to start working with the CPA and make sure yeah. that you're, you're kind of checking your boxes and dotting all your I's. And yeah, this is a major problem for my, especially one particular client. We get a lot of gifts right in December for the next year's operations. And mm -hmm. so I have to record the revenue per the auditors. Otherwise they'll come in and change all of my numbers. I have to record it in December, even though it's for the next year. And I have to be able to illustrate to the finance committee these are all the dollars we collected in December, but this is how we're going to spend them in you know, 2021 is how we have to do it every year. Okay, so let me jump into, I, I think this question is super applicable to a lot of organizations. Um, how do you account for recurring donations, say monthly gifts on an accrual basis? Are future contributions considered pledges? Uh, I've seen it both ways, to, to be honest with you. Uh, generally, unless they're a large dollar amount, this kind of goes back to kind of materiality and how much time administratively or goes back to my survival administratively. Um, it depends on the dollar amount. I mean, really, yes, you could track them. You could book the entire pledge if they filled out a pledge card and say, hey, I'm going to give you $5,000 divided evenly over, you know, 12 months. That might make sense for you from a materiality, meaning is it significant enough for you to keep track of? Um, other organizations more commonly, because they're usually like the $50 or the $100 a month. Um, and frankly, people's credit cards could get you know, expired or whatever, and then trying to track them down and get them to re-sign uh, could be challenging um, or to, you know, enter their new credit card. So a lot of the smaller gifts, people would generally just record them when they hit the bank account. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. Um, let's see. Trying to, I'm trying to pick the ones that I think will be the most universally applicable. I am going to pass all these questions on to Tasha, yeah. and um, I will also include links to her website so you guys can follow up directly as well. Um, okay, for the financial reports discussed to the balance sheet, PL, statement of cash flows, do you recommend that they reflect the last 12 months or what period of time? What, repeat that question, the, the last part of it. So for your financials, and I'm guessing they mean when they present to the board, do you recommend that they reflect the last 12 months or a different period of time? 
I like to just do year to date and compare it with year to date last year. So it might just be three months. It could be four months, but it's really kind of comparing this time last year, where were we? I've seen it done multiple ways if that's useful, um, especially in startup mode or something like that, where people are trying to compare not necessarily year over year, but some point in time. Um, but I usually do year to date. Okay. This one I know applies to everybody, or at least it will once we get out of, once we get out of COVID. Um, special events income, report it on a gross or net basis. So the so going back to end user, the 990 requires us to break them out separately. So we have to show, I mean, we can come on the schedule. It will show on the tax return. It will show kind of all the different ways that you earned revenue. And then you have to spell out your expenses. So I keep them in a separate line item, but you can certainly present them net. Like I could condense the report down and show it net. To me, it doesn't really matter. I do like to see the expenses right underneath the revenue so I can kind of see what were the net proceeds. But for purposes of tax preparation, I don't like muddying them up all in one account because um, then you have to go back and pull everything apart for purposes of the tax prep. That makes sense. Okay, let's go ahead and do two more. Sure. Um, a couple questions about reserves. What do you recommend doing if we have more than three months worth of cash reserves? How could that money be invested instead of sitting in our savings account? Well, the first thing I would do is talk to the board about 90 days is a great place to start. Uh, usually United Way or Better Business Bureau or a lot of charity watchdogs like to see a 25 to 75 percent reserve. So if cash is really the only kind of liquid asset you have that might be considered a reserve, um, you're right at that, you know, 90, you know, 25% threshold. Mm -hmm. uh, you might want to grow that more, not to say you can't put some of that in, in some sort of short-term investments, but talk to your board about what their operating reserve policy is going to look like. Just had a big conversation about this with a client yesterday uh, because we've accumulated quite a bit of cash. Um, so I would talk to your board about what their goal is how much cash do you want to have on hand? I agree keeping three months of cash. I'm not an investment advisor. I had full disclosure on that. What I've seen some of my clients do is start putting them into some sort of blended portfolio with the help of their finance committee or an investment manager, anything in excess of 90 days of cash. Um, I do have some clients that invest in short-term CDs that mature on a rolling schedule. So like three month CDs. So they're always having a CD mature. It's very low interest bearing, but also very low risk. Um, but yeah, usually in those sort of ways. Um, I do have a client, for example, with operating reserves. If you're an organization that has upwards of 100, 150% operating reserves, so you have way more cash than you know what to do with. One of the things you could talk to your board about is a spending policy on those reserves. Uh, this might sound weird to some of you, but we've all been there. We have a budget. We know we need that position. We can't afford a full-time position in our existing budget. Maybe we can afford half of it um, in our budget. We can make it work. But this is a way that the board can be intentional about the surpluses we've accumulated and how we are going to reinvest in our organization in a way that I think also would speak to our donors, right? If you're sitting on a mountain of money and, you know, as fundraising folks, <laughs> You know, what are you going to do with your own money? Why are you asking me? Um, we can say we're being very strategic and intentional, but we're spending, you know, 5% of that balance a year. Um, but secretly, we are also investing in an account that might yield us 6 to 9% market return. So we're still like growing it, but much slower. So there's a couple different strategies depending on how much more than 90 days you have that I would generally recommend. If nothing else, try to get it in some sort of interest bearing account with some sort of risk tolerance that you're comfortable with. That makes sense. And that is, I mean, that is a relevant topic. I know we we deal with so many nonprofits that are struggling or in startup mode, but some of them are very cash rich. And even mm -hmm. through the pandemic, I mean, some nonprofits have really grown significantly. So stewarding that is, is a big deal. Right. Okay. Um, let me see here. Do you, okay, so kind of tied to that same topic, somebody else said that, do you recommend beyond three months cash for operating reserve? I will say I love, yes, always. Um, it's just what you do with it. Uh, I, I also believe in not crippling your organization because, you know, here, here's how it really works in, in real, <laughs> in the real life. Um, it's either like feast or famine at the end of the year, right? And for me, if we're sitting on all of this money, 
how can we be strategic about reinvesting in our organization? So for example, when I was a CFO, I was literally the only administrative person. I did all the HR, I did all the payroll, oversaw the IT, all these things. I think they ended up hiring three people when I left. I don't say that in a way of bragging. They need, that's why I left. They needed that before. And if we could have convinced the board and we had something like 200% reserves, it was incredible. Um, I basically went to the board and pled a case like we're drowning over here and we need some help and we have the money. Can we just be smart about how we're going to invest it? And hey, hold us as a hold us accountable as a yeah. leadership team to absorb that into our budget. But how can we start spending those dollars? Um, so I think long-term strategy, uh, figure out ways to invest it to, but then also find ways to take the proceeds and reinvest that into the infrastructure of, of the organization. I, I see so many times we just keep hoarding more and more and more and more money, but yet it's still feast or famine, mostly, you know, famine. So uh, in the nonprofit space. That is a real perspective. So is the comment about when you, when you left and they had to get three people, I think that's every nonprofit pro, like we tend to be highly capable people. And so we're wearing too many hats and infrastructure is a major issue. Yeah. I'm going to pull one more um, off the chat for those who have stayed in the room. And I think this is a good question. I know it varies by state, but um, maybe you can speak to it generally. Should a small nonprofit budget under 700,000 a year pay to have its accounts audited, even if the audit is not being requested or required by funders? Can a review, a financial statement review be done instead? Oh, great question. Um, because I really hate spending money on things that don't have an immediate ROI. At the end of the day, I'm, I'm a for-profit entrepreneur, okay? Um, and I try to spend my clients' money as if I would to spend my own. So I have to feel like it's an investment. Um, and I really, I guess I'd have to understand a little bit more about the operations. If they're going after fundraising, they're going after funders that are going to require an audit. I don't think it's a good idea. Um, if they're simply just doing audit for a peace of mind, um, I think there's other less expensive ways to do it. Um, there's a review. So there's a couple of different things you can do. Number one, you can hire a, a competent CPA to, to handle the accounting and an accounting team with multiple layers of review. Um, and they should be pretty competent based on, you know, the questions you ask and have a pretty thorough understanding of what's going on. So that is just like, first and foremost, hiring a good person. Um, then you can do what we kind of call agreed upon procedures. That means you can hire an independent firm to come in and do an assessment of your internal controls. Because a lot of times when people say audit, um, I hear this a lot in the faith-based community because they're generally running their back office on volunteers, that they really want a, an audit um, for their internal controls, which actually is not an audit. An audit is testing the numbers, not your internal controls, right? And so really asking yourself, what do you want from that? Um, so you can do an agreed upon procedures to get a lot of the things that you want accomplished for a much lower price tag. They give it more of as a project consulting basis. Um, you could do a review and the difference between a review and audit, uh, review is like a baby audit. They're gonna look at your numbers, they're gonna ask a lot of questions, they're gonna take your word for it, okay? In audit, they're gonna come in, they're gonna ask lots of questions. Uh, they're not going to take your word for it. They're gonna say, great, that seems to make sense, but prove it through documentation. So it's really just a different level of scrutiny. Um, that's the difference between a review and an audit. The, really the only things I look for is, are you looking to get accredited and are they going to require so many years of audits? Um, are you looking to go after fundraising opportunities that would require audits? If that is true, I would say it's probably worth it. If you're in a sweet situation where you don't have any of those funding sources and you're not necessarily looking to go after them, I'm making some, maybe you're earned income. Maybe your school, for example. I have a couple of schools that operate basically like a for-profit um, and they earn tuition and tuition covers the cost of their programming. They don't really have a need to go out for big government grants. Uh, they're not doing Head Start, Early Head Start. They're not looking for big foundation gifts because their private pay parents cover the cost then there's no reason to spend $15,000 on an audit, in my opinion. Um, but you do want to make sure that you hire competent people to make sure your books are in order. And I happen to know someone. So guys, check out Charity CFO. Tasha does do direct service. She has an entire team of amazing CPAs. Um, everything she talked about, I'm sure they can help you out with. We'll make sure we include some links in the follow-up email as well as the recording of today's session. 
Tasha, I can't thank you enough. You're always dynamite. You're always extremely um, providing extremely valuable information. We are so grateful. Thank you. Appreciate that. Okay. Take care. Bye, everyone.